And so, Dr. Grace, as we must all learn to call you from now on, <laughs> to mark the occasion, pray accept this handsomely inscribed marble clock and a check for 1,485 pounds to assist you with buying yourself a practice. <laughs> On, uh, uh, on behalf of all the subscribers who contributed to the fund, may I say that it comes in recognition of all you have done for our national sport. Yeah. 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 A game that is open to all, from prince to peasant, calling as it does for those qualities most characteristic of Englishmen. Patience, fortitude, pluck, respect for law, and love of fair play, of which you, sir, are the nation's champion. Yeah. Yeah. The Champion by Martin Worth, with Timothy Spall as W.G. Grace. Lily White's Cricketing Companion. A counter match between South Wales Club and Gentlemen of Sussex at Hove, July 1864. Match drawn, but notable for the extraordinary performance of W.G. Grace, whose 170 not out on the first day was remarkable in being made by a player who had not yet reached his 16th birthday. <laughs> the Oval, July 1866. A huge crowd saw W.G. Grace make the highest number of runs ever scored on this ground, a remarkable feat for a boy just 18 years old. Well played! Did you see that, Papa? Oh, I wish it was at Eaton with me. We'd soon lick Harrow with him in the side. What school does he go to, Papa? Oh. Going then to see Grace at Bramble Lake. Oh, oh, you come in, sir. Why am I walking out? No, Mill can't afford to have one man loom. Grace is here playing Yorkshire. Oh, yeah, I know, but that doesn't I mean I just... might go along and watch myself, sir. Here. Does that think we'll get into ground? <laughs> get you, Regis! He's not a bloody southerner! <laughs> Shilling? It's sixpence! Not when W.G. Gray's plays. Can you read that now, do you? Read? Oh, me? Come on, Edison. The crowd are getting restive. Have somebody bolt to me. I mean... Oh, what's the use, Skipper? I put him down where I want, and Mr. Gray, he puts him where he wants. He ought to be made to play with a little bat. <laughs> Very Grace. Did you have a good journey? How do you do? Yes. How do you do? Quite delightful. Oh, but do call me Agnes, please. Of course. Cousin Agnes. Uh, I'll take the luggage now, Porter. Thank you, sir. Will you come? I I've got the family pony trap in the yard. Is this your first visit to the West Country? It's the first time I've ever left London. Well, we'll give you a good time at Down End, I hope. It's simple enough, child, surely. I wish you'd stop calling me your child, Mother. But you are. I'm 34. <laughs> now, where do you want us all to sit tonight? Henry at the head of the table, I suppose. Of course, as head of the family now. With you at the other end. Mm -hmm. Uncle Pocock on your right. He's my brother, dear. And Willie on your left as your favourite son. I have no favourite sons, Fanny. Oh, Mama. Now, just be sure to put Agnes beside him. He won't say a word to her all evening if he's got you to talk to. Mm. I'd better put Edward on her other side. At least Edward will give her his attention, if she's as pretty as I dare say she is. Edward's married now, Fanny, with two children. <laughs> is Alfred coming tonight, too? Mm. Put Alfred the far end with Henry. He talks only of horses these days. Well, at least it's a change from cricket. Now, what about Blanche and the Reverend Dan? The Reverend Dan is now your brother-in-law, Fanny. I'm sure he deserves to be called John. 
Never can I see him as any other than Willie's tutor. You need not hold that against him. Why? What did he ever teach Willie? John Dan is an excellent wicketkeeper, Fanny, provided he has a reliable long stop. Oh, dispose them all as you think fit. Mama says you come from a large family yourself. My brothers and sisters are all married now and live away. Most of mine do too, but not far away. My eldest brother Henry has his practice over there at Kingswood. Alfred's a doctor at Chipping Sodbury, and Edward's got a practice at Thornbury, all within a few miles of us. And all doctors? I'll be one myself one day, mm. probably long before Willie, even if I am two years younger. It's hard to think of the famous W.G. Grace as a medical student. I have to tell you, Agnes, it's not a thought that bothers Willie very much. <laughs> How's that? No, no. I swear I... Missed. Got... You're too impetuous, Willie. I remember telling you that when I first taught you how to hold a gun. Fetch it, Ha! <laughs> you see? Not even the dog's prepared to look for it. That's the sovereign you owe me. Oh, we're not done yet. There's a deal more game to be found in the spinny. Come on, Ted. I'll still back more than you. I'll shoot it. Mm, with Edward. But he should be back soon. It's almost dark. Whole morning out hunting, then he goes shooting. Oh, so discourteous to his cousin. Fred's entertaining Agnes, mother. He took her to the orchard to show her the pitch. I did not invite Agnes here for Fred's sake, Fanny. We used to practice there every day, as soon as the sun was up, from March to October. I've been showing Agnes the pitch, Mama. Oh, you must be quite frozen, my dear. Come and get warm by the fire. Even Mother used to bowl to us sometimes. And as a fielder, she could hit the stumps from 70 yards. Don't exaggerate, Fred. There's nothing she doesn't know about the game. She keeps us all up to the mark. You make your cousin think me quite an Amazon. Father and Uncle Pocock would coach us, and my sisters did the fielding. The girls played too. Oh, just fielded, along with the dogs. Dogs? Ah, <laughs> oh, here's Willie at last. Ponto could take a catch at cover, even when fielding at mid-wicket. <laughs> Willie, you remember your cousin, Agnes? Ah, to be sure I do. I uh, can't quite think where, though. Oh, Willie. I, mean, I was only 13. I doubt he even noticed me. You stayed with the days during the Surrey match of the Oval six years ago. And somehow managed to run in an athletics event, too. Oh, that's right. Crystal Palace, the quarter-mile hurdle. Which I saw you win. I remember. It clashed with the last day of the cricket when my skipper let me take time off. Well, I made a few runs for them, so I had. <laughs> and I was only sitting around in the pavilion. Edward. Ah, oh, Mama. <laughs> Is your wife not with you? Uh, she has a cold, Mama, and sends her apologies. Do I have the pleasure of meeting my cousin Agnes? My third son, Edward, Agnes. How do you do? I had a notion you might be pretty, but my word. If I weren't a married man, He'd I'd probably propose to you on the spot. <laughs> really? Time was he put the question to every fair young lady he met. He was once presented with a writ for breach of promise when going out to bat at the Oval. The girl was just trying it on, Fred. That's <laughs> what Alfred He said. gave it to the umpire and went on to make a century. <laughs> My brother was as fine a cricketer as the world had ever seen in those days, Agnes. And still would be if it weren't for his damn doctorate. You'll be a doctor yourself one day, Willie. At present, it would be news to his professors even to hear he was a medical student. And besides, it's not because of my profession I don't enjoy the reputation I had once as a cricketer. Oh, what else, Tad? What else? Oh, Henry, how good of you to come. Naturally, we have come, Mama. <laughs> my eldest son, Henry, Agnes. How do you do, cousin? Uh, may I present my wife? Agnes Day, my dear, from London. Uh, Pocock, I believe. Yes, indeed. Willie! Uncle Pocock! What the deuce were you up to in America? Maybe I was just reading an account of the sportsman. Playing cricket in the dark? Against Americans? <laughs> so, so, uh, all I could think to say was... Uh, I thank you for the honour you have done me. Never have I seen a goodlier company of fair ladies as are gathered here tonight, or hope to see wherever I go when I sat down. That's all. Pass the port, Willie. <laughs> to, to such a broad, I used just the same speech a few days later in Philadelphia. Ah, to more fair ladies. Why the devil did you take me on that tour with you, Willie? Ah, <laughs> well, they were a bunch of senators that time, so I just changed the words to... Never have I seen such a goodly company of distinguished statesmen as are gathered here tonight. Oh, I see where I go. <laughs> I use it over and over again after that. Mama. Oh, yes. May I ask how much 
longer you all mean to sit over your paws. I did not invite the family here tonight to have the men in one room and the ladies in another. Your cousin Agnes is quite neglected, Willie. Come into the drawing room. Fanny is playing to us all quite delightfully. Sorry, Mama. Hold on, folks. Do you ride, cousin? Ride? A horse. In London? I did have lessons. Then you shall come out with Willie and me. We all have horses here. It's cricket in the summer, but hunting in the winter. Oh, thank you. I love oh, you. bravo, Fanny, bravo! <laughs> Mother tells me you're her great grandniece. Well, that makes you a poker. America. So you have to be a country poker. girl. At home. Oh, that's it. Come along, Mama. You and I shall lead up the dancing. Dancing? We can't just sit around talking. Edward, Edward, ask us not to dance. With pleasure. Now, Willie, if anyone should ask. Get your husband on his feet, Brad. That's it, Fanny. But faster, faster. I will not. Oh, you sure you've forgotten how to dance, Mama. Faster, Fanny. Faster. <laughs> Willie. <laughs> <laughs> Ground, I do declare. If only the one the other end could hit like that. Oh, no one can hit like W.G. Grace. Except another Grace. And Edward's not playing today. Fred is. He's coming in number six. You mean there's a third one? Oh, there's George. I'm sorry if I don't know your name. Agnes Day. Lucy Jervis. George, who is that frightful stonewaller out there with Grace? Longman. I was at Eton with him. But they should have played you instead. <laughs> George plays cricket for Oxford University, Miss Day. It's about the only thing he does do at Oxford University. Now, be fair, Lucy. I've only missed two terms so far. But I don't think I have the pleasure... Oh, I'm sorry. This is Agnes Day. We got talking to each other quite by chance. Lord Harris. Lord Harris? Miss Day is a friend of one of the players, she tells really? me. Really? Which? Mr. Grace. Grace? I'm his cousin. Are you now? I toured America with Willie last winter. But you said he was a player, Miss Day. Grace is not a player. He's a gentleman. <laughs> What's the difference? Oh, goodness, was there ever such blasphemy heard at Lord's? Gentlemen play cricket for love of the game. It's only the professionals who do it for money that we refer to as mere players. Uh, they love the game too, Lucy. Look, you see that fielder down there on the boundary? Well, he's a coal miner from Yorkshire. Of course he loves the game. He'd rather be paid to play cricket than down a mine, wouldn't he? Who taught him to play if he's only a miner? It was he and his kind who taught George to play. Cricket belonged to the lower orders till the gentry got hold of it. Now, you can't deny that, George. No, but... That's why this match is so important to them. The players against the gentlemen. A chance to hit back at their masters. I'm sure they don't see it that way. My father says if it weren't for the gentlemen versus players match, we'd have had a revolution in this country by now. Oh, what nonsense, Lucy. Well, every other country in Europe has come near to one. Oh, because they don't play cricket. Exactly. It's only in England the class war can be played out here. Oh, oh look, they're putting on shore again. Just as I thought, they were coming in for lunch. Well, there's still time for another over before half past two. It's only four balls. And when a batsman's looking forward to a well-earned rest, that's often the time you can rattle him out. Oh, I can't believe Willie will be rattled. <laughs> Except that Alfred Shaw's the only bowler he's ever admitted to being troubled by. So, what's your skipper at now, Phillips? Not on lunchtime. If he gets you out first ball, Mr. Grice, you'll get to your dinner before we will. All right, Shaw. Sure. I'm ready for you. What the devil have they been doing to this pitch? Oh, Must have missed his off stump by a whisker. It didn't come to him fast. Well, he's not a fast bowler, but... Oh, my turn. What are you trying to do, Shaw? Break my toe? Oh, he got his bat over that one just in time. Oh, the crowd will be so disappointed if he gets out now. They'll drift off altogether. Quiet, Lucy. Oh, oh, he'll be caught. Oh. Oh. Miss it! You butterfingers! Run, 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 Mr. Longman! He can't catch that! Miss it! <laughs> and he has to! Is he allowed to shout out to fielders like that? He must put off the catcher, surely. Well, that's just what your cousin intended it to do, Mr. Day. If a fielder can't concentrate, he shouldn't be there. Last one. How's that? Well, umpire, speak your mind. Is W.G. Grace out or not? Not out, sir. <laughs> Time for lunch, I think. All right. 
with plump. Listen to me, young feller. The crowd have come to see him bat, not you bowl. Uh, I have to hand it to shore. Any less observant on boy might well have given me out that last ball. There'd have been a riot if he had. What do you mean, Fred? Ah, here you are, Willie. Not lunching with the rest of the gentlemen. You see that hit I made for the road? Wasn't it splendid? I don't remember noticing. What? Of course I did, you nincompoop. I could have done with you out there with me this morning, George. If I can't have Edward, I'd like someone what to... What are you make... complaining about, Willie? You've done well enough with whoever's been with you. 75 not out. According to the umpire, anyway. Now, look you here, George. I'll see you in the dining room, Willie. Here's Shaw for you. Shaw? I sent for him. To apologize. You want to see me, Mr. Gray? Ah, sorry to take you from your dinner. The players don't get dinner, sir. We have to bring us on. Oh, no. Why don't you remember to say great before and after? <laughs> There's a fine spell of bowling this morning, Shaw. Thank you, my lord. You deserve more wickets. One more, anyway. Oh, no. Point questioning the umpire's decision, Shaw. Oh, oh, Willie. You do it all the time. Only when it's wrong. Now, what will you be at next winter, Shaw? At Maloom in Nottingham. Making stocking. Why? I've been invited to take a team to Australia. So let the ladies go bare legs this winter and work your fingers on a ball for me instead. This none can do it better. We sail in October, back at the end of March. What will you pay? Pay? I make good money in the winter, my lord. I haven't got down to details yet. It's not details, to me, Mr. Gray. Very well, then. Seven and six a week living expenses, second class passage, and 150 pounds of emolument. How's that? I'd rather make stocking. Good afternoon, Mr. Gray. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> Lord. That's damn cheek, if you ask me. But I'm blue. <laughs> I tell you this, George. What? I'll hit the bugger all around the ground this afternoon, so I will. How many times have I told you not to play across the line of the ball, Willie? There are times when that's just the thing to do, Mama. Well, there clearly wasn't one of them yesterday, from what you just said. Caught and bowled. By whom? Sure. But for 168. As your telegram informed me. You'd better take Shaw to Australia with you. Uh, he's turned me down. Mm. I'm having the devil's own job to raise a team. Not even Lord Harris can favour me with his company. He's to spend the winter studying, he says. It's Henry's opinion you should do that yourself. At this rate, Fred will be a doctor before you are. Yes, yeah, well, I meant to do something about that. Mm, very glad to hear it. By taking Fred to Australia with me, too. Oh, Willie, I can see you and I must have a serious talk. Now, can you see my fellow car anywhere? You're going to church? Mm. Choir practice, an hour of joyful singing. Mm -hmm. Danny, do you know where my Psalter and hymn book are? I've not heard you play your harp for a long while, Mother. You've not been here for a long while, Willie. I've taken to playing it in the garden lately. In the garden? Mm, beautiful out there this summer evening. Oh. Takes my mind off cricket when I'm waiting for your telegrams with the latest score. It's not in your sitting room. Oh. No, I just found it, Fanny. It's a trap on it. Do you want the gardener to drive you? Certainly not, child. I'm still quite capable of managing a pony trap. I'll be home at six. Mm. I'm playing west with Alfred tonight. Your first night home for more than a week. Been studying a book on the subject. You studying? How to win at west, it's called. No, I still haven't ought to give a master that game. You usually say reading is bad for the eyesight. Or does that just apply to medical books? <laughs> I'll get the trap brought round to the front door, Mother. Oh, what am I going to do with you, Willie? Edward had long since settled to his profession by the time he was your age. With the result that he wasn't even available for the gentleman yesterday. You can see why I'm not in any haste to qualify myself. And who is to provide for you in the meantime? Let alone find the fees for the medical school you never can bring yourself to go to. I made a very good deal with the promoter for my Australian tour, Mother. If I get up a lot more fixtures next season than my own United England eleven. I can drive a very hard bargain with the club we play again. Your father would turn in his grave. Gentlemen shouldn't play for money. You'd do better to make a good marriage. Marriage? Why, <laughs> I'd have thought I'd take a wife would just add to the expense. On the contrary, with the right family, a dowry, marriage settlement, these things can be arranged. There's a trap at the door. I've asked Agnes Day to come and stay with us again next week. Cousin Agnes? I'm sure she'd enjoy seeing the club play Yorkshire at Clifton College. It promises to be a very good match. The cricket, I mean. Over. Crowd expect you to hit the ball, but you're not playing shove, ain't you, you know. I'll play as I choose, Mr. Grace. You ball and I'll bat. If you go on blocking every ball I send, you're going to have to take myself off, so I am. That's just what I want you to do. 
Oh, what will the crowd say then? Brad, take the next over. All right, Willie. We'll wingle this chappy out somehow. I see Mother's arriving at the ground. Oh, so she They're is. They're putting up a tent over there by the chapel. Hey, Willie, is that cousin Agnes with her? Ooh, devilish handsome girl, I must say. Set him down one on his legs, Brad. Don't you and your brother ever stop chattering? The one of you behind me at short leg and the other in front at pointer. It's like batting in a parrot house. And don't stand so close, Dr. Grace, or my back could catch thee. Yeah, if you can raise it an inch above the ground, that is. Come on, Fred. Bowl up. Oh. Oh. You could have caught that, Ted. I could not. <laughs> you could too. What did you say? Uh, what, what you said? He dropped me. My uh, brother's the finest filter at point there's ever been. Uh, but you said you said... Well, what I say is one thing. No one makes remarks about the graces in my presence. Put him on his toes, Fred. Coming up. Oh, no. Caught <laughs> <Thought> and bowed. <laughs> well, that wasn't on my toes. Well, meant to be, boy. We have our own ways of communicating here. But we'll wait for all that, Fred. Mother, are you sure you're not cold out here? Do you know where Willie is, Danny? I saw him go over to the orchard just now with Agnes. Why? I just wondered. See that five-barred gate over there? Mm hmm I once jumped over that seven times running in under a minute. What for? <laughs> Just because Edward could only do it six times. <laughs> Not that Mother was the least impressed when I beat him. What's that music I keep hearing, Willie? Sounds like a harp. It's Mama. She's playing in the shrubbery. A harp? Does she not play beautifully? She's very musical, my mother. I'd have never thought that of anyone in this family. Should we not go back to her? I copied Edward in everything at one time. From Edward, I learned how to ride, shoot, run, jump. <laughs> but there's one thing he never did teach me. I don't think I wanted him to either. Um, teach you what? How you, um, <laughs> how you, uh, bowl a maiden over. <laughs> it's a cricketing term. It means... Uh... I know what it means in cricket. What are you trying to tell me, Willie? Agnes. <laughs> Willie, where are you off to? To see if it's coming down the well. The well? Oh, there you are, Agnes. Where's he gone? To fetch a bottle of champagne, it seems. He always insists we keep one down the well for special occasions, so it'll stay at the right temperature. I remember my father giving him champagne once. The day he won the hurdles race at Crystal Palace. I don't think that was so special. It was 224 not out the day before may have been, but... It was special for me. I think that's when I first came to love him, Mrs. Grace. Oh, I'm sure you make him very happy, Agnes. I just hope he'll do the same for you. Buddy! Bring some glasses to the shrubbery! <laughs> we'll announce the engagement at our birthday on Friday, Mama. Did you know my mother and I have birthdays the same day, Agnes? I did not. How long should the engagement be? Three weeks? Three months would be a bit more silly. Uh, that takes us to October. Well, why not? Mm. We shall have our honeymoon in Australia, Agnes. Oh, Australia? We'll sail there together on October the 23rd. Uh. With my team. <gasps> That's him. Has to be. Where? Coming down the gangway now. Big pillar with a beard. Looks like he'll need taking down a peg or two. Uh, Mr. Grace? Welcome to Australia. John MacArthur, Melbourne Cricket Club. This is Mr. Conway. Ah, oh, yes, Conway, the promoter. We've corresponded. No, I want Mrs. Grace in a comfortable hotel right away. She's not feeling well. I feel better for just being on firm ground, Willie. <laughs> Rough voyage, was it? Oh. Well, I've got my own carriage over there. It'll be at your disposal as long as you're in Melbourne. Shall we go? What about the luggage? Conway will see to all that, Agnes. Conway will see to it. It's a pretty hefty itinerary Conway's planned for you, but it's a big country, Australia. I hope the railways are as good as they are in England. <laughs> you bet your life they are. They just don't reach quite all the places that want to pit their skills against you. 
Oh, this dust and I'll get up your nose. How much longer in this thing, Governor? It's a saver, all of us, Babcock. What are you potting at, Governor? Carrots! Dearest Mama, we have been travelling to some of our matches in little more than an open cart across the roughest country you can conceive of. Our first day, we encountered a dust storm. Our next, a thunderstorm. Such torrential rain that the cart got stuck in the mud. Now what's going on? Get out and push, Babcock! In this? Give a hand, Arthur! Come on, all of you, with a match to play tomorrow! Yeah, After 12 hours on the road, we arrived at last to be greeted by a brass band and hundreds of excited townsfolk. But the band frightened the horses. And the whole carriage overturned. Willie found himself having to make a speech. I thank you for the honour you have done us. Never have I seen such a goodly company of fine Australians as are gathered here tonight or hope to see wherever we go. The warmth of the welcome from the people is wonderful, but it's curiously different on the field, where we seem to be regarded as enemies. And the pitches are abominable. We can't play on that umpire! It's covered in stone. Oh, you're just sweeping away from the batting area before you play. I want it cleared. This is Australia, Mr. Grace. We don't have your dandy soft English horns out here. This is a hard country, and we play a hard game. On another ground, the pitch was so bumpy, we called for a roller. A roller? Did you bring one with you? Fred, get off it out here. His feet are almost as big as mine. Together, we'll stamp it level. <laughs> Once or twice, there was so much dust, the ball just stopped dead where it pitched. And once, after we'd made a fair score, we went out to field to find the umpire had moved the stumps. What's this, that? A new pitch? Yours was new when you started. Only fair for the home side to have a new one, too. You can't change pitches in the middle of a match. This is not how you play cricket. How we play it here, Mr. Grace. Against New South Wales at Sydney, their most popular hero was caught at the wicket by Arthur Bush, much to the disappointment of the huge crowd. But just as the next man in had taken his guard, we saw the previous batsman returning to the crease. Why are you coming back? You were given out. Skipper says your keeper had his nose in front of the stump, so the catch don't count. You're not needed yet, Steve. I'm batting on. Three batsmen at the wicket. Fred, I'm needing the side off. Follow me. Quite right, Willie. Cricket apart, we are being entertained with lavish receptions in our honour. Some festivities go on all night, with Willie much enjoying the dancing. Come and join us, Fred. Sitting up here in a hotel bedroom on your own. I just played such a good joke on Arthur. You know the duck he made this afternoon? Well, he's down there dancing. Whenever he takes to the floor, I've got the band to go whack, whack on one of their <laughs> instruments. What are you doing? Uh, writing a letter to Mama. Oh, I thought we'd hire a buggy tomorrow and drive out into the bush to do some shooting. Quail, parrots, maybe even kangaroos. Will you come? I'd like one day of rest, Willie. Any message for Mother? Tell her I'll uh, just write to her as soon as I can. Willie says he'll write to you just as soon as he has a moment to do so. Your loving son, Fred. Not a mention of poor Agnes in the whole letter. She's probably staying in Melbourne. I know she has relations there. I'm sure Willie will tell us when he writes himself. Practicing in the nets, Mr. Grace. I'm surprised you need to. Seems to have attracted a fair number of spectators. 
which is more than be said for the exhibition match you made me play yesterday. It's in our contract that if a game ever finishes early, you fill out the time with another one. You're making more out of this tour than I am, Mr. Grace. I should hope so. Hey, you lad! It's line and length that matters. There's a bowler in England called Shaw who can pitch him on a saucer. I wouldn't have thought that playing against these boys was giving you much practice. Uh, I'm not in the nets for that, Conway. It's your bowlers I'm trying to give some tips to. What the devil? Who bowled that? Hey, just a minute. You, you, where are you going? Who was that, Conway? He'd be playing against you for Victoria tomorrow if he hadn't got a thigh injury. That fellow's injured. I dare say you'll meet him again one day. Frank Spofforth. Oh, a letter from Willie at last. Well, at least he explains why Agnes stayed in Melbourne for most of the tour. She must have been pregnant the day they arrived. Pregnant? Poor girl. To be at sea all the way from Australia when you're six months with child. <laughs> Will we ever be home? April 30th, Captain, oh. sir. Just in time for the season. Oh, but if it should come early. It never starts till May. <sighs> I only need a week to find my landing to get some branches again. I'm not thinking of cricket. Agnes. It's a lawyer told me. Mm, but with this constant heaving of the ship. You better come below and lie down. <sighs> I don't want my son to open his innings on board ship. Oh. No cricketer of note has ever been born at sea. July 18th is when I miss Factor now. Your birthday. And mother's. Just think how it would please her to have her grandson born that day. Oh. But he wasn't, was he? Born on her birthday? <laughs> Not quite, but it was a close-run thing. To wonder he didn't come a lot earlier from what you told me of that dreadful voyage. Oh, yes. Oh, at least the child I'm carrying now is having an easier passage than poor Gilbert did. <laughs> Hi, Mrs. Grace. This is a pleasant surprise. Since Willie has again deserted her, George, I asked her to afternoon tea. <laughs> So where's Willie then? He made 344 against us at Canterbury yesterday. He's surely not playing again today. Today he's gone home. To Earl's Court? Well, then should uh, you not... To Bristol, Lucy. Willie and I may live in London while he does his hospital training, but he'll never regard that as home. How's he getting on at Bart's? To have the champion visit you on the wards must make it the most popular place to be ill in in the whole <laughs> metropolis. He could finish his hospital training altogether in 18 months if it were not for the season. But tomorrow he plays Nottinghamshire at Clifton. Run up, Ted! There could be five in this person real quick! For their sake, I hope he treats them more kindly than he did Kent. Then as soon as that match is over, they've got Yorkshire coming. Hey, well there's Alfred Shaw on the platform with the knots, lads. Going home after the drooping they got from the Graces yesterday. <laughs> what was it the big old made against you, Alf? 177? <laughs> do the same to you tomorrow, Tom. Uh, oh, even the champion stamina will be given out there now. Huzzah! Oh, oh it, it, it was off his arm. Can't have it. Shan't have it. Won't have it. But have it you will, Mr. Grace. It was off my glove, Willie. <sighs> Well, Bolt, Tom. So, we'll have to support me now, then. How much support do you want when you've got over 300, Mr. Grace? By my reckoning, you've not stopped nigh on 800 runs in less than a week. You could surely forgo some of the exhibition matches, at least, with you. What kind of cricket would they say in Scotland or Ireland, let alone places up north like Darlington or Lincoln, if it weren't from a United England tour? Besides, those are the fixtures I make most money from. Come on, wait. Oh, confound these hearts of Henry's. Should we put up the grass? Can I bet today, Papa? You're a little bit too young to start cricket yet, Gilbert. I'd started at his age. Oh, now you've woken up, Edgar. <laughs> it's good for them to yell. I learned that in a maternity ward. Stretches their lungs. But oh, Willie, slow down. I don't want to give birth to a third child in a pony trap. We're going downhill. May as well make the most of it. Oh, Willie, please. Uh. Oh. Now the beast's so exhausted, I'd let oh. make up the other side. Whoa! Oh, get out and walk so I will. Still have 16 stone less to carry. If I'd been so set on staying with Henry when we got back from London, Agnes, we wouldn't have to make this journey from Kingswood every Sunday. Oh, you enjoy it, Willie. 
Damned if I can see why we couldn't have all escaped with Mother. Plenty of room at down at. With all your making out of cricket, it puzzles me we can't have a home of our own. When I'm qualified. You've been a medical student now for over ten years. I've studied hard enough this winter, when I could have been in Australia. Sean and Lily White are doing that job for you. Oh, bunch of professionals just looking to turn an honest penny for themselves in the winter. They can't do what I do for the game. If they let themselves be trounced as they were in Melbourne last month. You'll be too old for cricket one day, Willie. And if you don't have a profession to turn to by then... I'll have one by then. You could have one next year if you'd just give up cricket for a while. <laughs> mother says the same. you are disgusted with your mother. Of course I have. I dare say she's right. She usually is. You'd only have to miss one season. What did you get out of practice, though? The... <laughs> it's into a practice I'd like to see you settle before I die. Die. And with you not playing for a while, it might give someone else a chance to show them. Very well, it's decided. Put away my bat for a jar full of leeches. Oh, Willie, it's so sensible, really. I'll talk to Henry about a practice for you. And there are such nice houses to be had round here. Uh, Willie's always said he'd like to live in Clifton when he's qualified, Martha. Clifton? Well, that's much too far from home. So that if we can afford it, the boys can go as day boys to Clifton College. Perhaps even to university later. It'll be the first of the graces ever to do that. I could have gone to Cambridge myself, Mother. You? <laughs> oh, you never even went to a proper school, really. It wasn't as a scholar they wanted him at Cambridge. And it's it? not as a scholar I want Gilbert there, either. What do you mean? George Harris had no need of book learning. He was as much a duffer at all that at Eton as I was with the Reverend Dan. They'd never have managed even a past degree at Oxford if Lucy hadn't taken a firm line with him. But he'll be in the government soon, they say. As a peer of the realm, he does have certain advantages. <laughs> That's not what makes him a leader of men. It's the way they do it at these public schools. They understand what cricket's all about. Cricket? Cricket builds character. Gilbert's to be the man I want him to be. It's not a playing field at Clifton he'll learn it. Besides, to take my place at Lord's one day. Oh, Willie. Uh, sorry to be so unconscionably late. I've been presiding over an interminable inquest. You hold inquests on the Sabbath, Edward? As county coroner, Mama, I'm entitled to hold them when I choose. During the week, they interfere with my hunting. <laughs> you had the news, Willie. What news? The Australians are coming to take us on our own game, on our own ground. The devil they yeah. are. Conway's getting up a team. They, they sail next week. I suppose they think after putting it off over Shore and Lily White in Melbourne, they're the cat's whiskers now. We'll soon show that. Willie, you've just told your mother and me... This you... puts a different complexion on the matter altogether. I'm sure Mother understands. A damn colony thinking it could... They have to be taught a sharp lesson, Agnes. I'll need all the practice I can get. What's the time, Fanny? It's gone ten o'clock. Don't you want to go to bed? I can't understand. I've never known Willie not send me a telegram before. First day of the match against Australia and still no word. Who can that be at this time of night? Perhaps it's Edward. Why, Fred! I took the six o'clock train from Paddington. You've been at Lord's? All day. The MCC batted first. They were all out for 33. Good gracious. Willie? He managed four. Four? But the Australians didn't do much better. Thanks to Alfred Shaw, we got rid of them for only 41. So England batted again. And? This time, Willie was out first ball. Clean ball by Spofford. The whole side was dismissed for just 19. It didn't take the Australians long to knock up the 12 they needed for victory. You mean it's all over? A three-day match? Won by the Australians in just four and a half hours. Yeah, I feel a bit groggy for a day or two, but it had to come off, Smithers. But be thankful it wasn't the whole hand. Yes, sir. As parish doctor, I shall put in a report about the machinery in that workshop. I'll have the place closed down so I will. And put us all out to work, Dr. Grace? Not that there's a job for me there anymore. With that dust in your lungs, you should get yourself something in the open air, Smithers. Know of something, do you, sir? Who was that peeping at the window? That's the second time I caught sight of it. Boy, it's that young rascal of mine, Gilbert. Bertie! Oh, give that boy such a hiding. Bertie! Come here! I was only watching, Papa. What did you do with it? Do with it? Do with what? His thumb. 
You chopped it off. Where's Dr. Gray? It's horrible. Right, Uncle Henry. Willie. Willie, send the boy away. I have something to tell you. Well, along, Bertie. I'll deal with you later. I've got some dreadful news, Willie. Quite dreadful. It's mother. It's mother, isn't it? No. No, it's Fred. Fred? Oh, no. George, listen. News of the death of Mr. G. F. Grace, the young cricketer, reached Bristol yesterday. What? At first it was thought to be a hoax, but on further Let inquiry... Let me see that. In a hotel, if you please, in Basingstoke. What was he doing there? On his way to a match, it says. Caught a chill. It turned to pneumonia and died from it. My God. All alone in a hotel bedroom. Well, this will destroy Willie. Oh, Willie will survive it. But I can think of someone who might not. Wisdom's Cricketing Almanac. Gloucestershire versus Lancashire, Old Trafford, July 1884. Opening the batting for Gloucestershire in their second innings, Dr. E.M. Grace was splendidly caught at mid-off. But his brother had no sooner succeeded him at the wicket when a telegram arrived for the two Gloucestershire doctors announcing the death of their mother, Mrs. Grace. It was decided to, at once, abandon the match. I can envisage players having to leave a game under such sad circumstances, but for the match to be abandoned. When I read that report in Wisden for last year, I realised what a tribute it was to your mother-in-law. Willie says no woman has ever been mentioned in the columns of Wisden before, nor likely to be again. I dare say you'll get a mention yourself one day. <laughs> oh, I'm quite sure I shall never be so honoured. There was ever only one Mrs. Grace, even for Willie at times. Yes. It can't have been altogether easy for you. But any jealousy I felt, George, was always tempered by the fact if it weren't for his mother, I would never have had the good fortune to be his wife. It was Mark who persuaded him to marry me. Oh, I'm sure he needed no persuasion. He'd have been a bachelor all his life otherwise. <laughs> the boys won't let me bat. It's not fair. Now, Bessie, where are your manners bursting in like that? <gasps> Say, how do you do to Lord Harris? How do you do? Not even your grandmother batted, Bessie. Cricket's not a game for young ladies. Why shouldn't it be? Don't answer back, child. I'm just as good as they are, Mama. Run along. Go and tell me if Charlie's still asleep in the pram. I can bowl Edgar out easily. Even Bertie sometimes. <laughs> she can too. How old is she now? Seven. And the boys? Gilbert's eleven. He'll be going to Clifton soon. All Edgar wants to do is join the Navy. The Navy? He talks of nothing but sea battles. Ah, here's Willie. He does his doctor's rounds on a bicycle? Yes, and with 17 stone of him going full tilt, woe betide anyone who steps across the path. Bertie Smithers has to be there somewhere. Oh, I lost my hat, Agnes. Good riddance, I say, that dreadful old hat. Sometimes you look more like a farmer than a doctor. Now, come into the sitting room. Lord Harris is here. George? He's staying with the Duke of Beaufort and came over to see us. Excellent. George, we'll come to the match. I'm on 163 and intend to put Middlesex through a lot more leather hunting yet. Your wife didn't tell me you were in the middle of a match. And you to resume his innings in exactly one hour. I'll go and pack your bag for you, Willie. At least I can't stop without me. <laughs> oh, oh, which is something of a pity, since I didn't get the bed till five. After batting all yesterday, what were you up to? Playing whist? <laughs> I was at a confinement. A what? Woman in Bedminster. It's quite disgraceful, these hovels they live in. You should pass a law about it, George. Tell that chap Gladstone from me. <laughs> it's Lord Salisbury who's Prime Minister now, Willie. Who? You'd do better to tell Joe Chamberlain. It's the lack of fresh air, if you ask me. And not enough to eat. So there's no, no fight in them. Not you could say that of Fred, though, could you? Carried off by a chill. <laughs> Makes no sense. No. Anyway, how are you, George? Fine, thank you. You met the boys? That Gilbert of mine is the makers of a fine player. I truly believe that in seven or eight years' time I'll have him beside me at Lord. Ah, so you still mean to be playing then yourself. I'm glad to hear it. When the MCC gave you that clock on the occasion of your becoming a doctor, you left us all very worried by the speech you made. <laughs> I remember. Lord Russell went on about patience required at the wicket, and I said, it was patience of a different sort I'd been needing now. <laughs> Everyone laughed, didn't they? Yeah, as long as you didn't mean it. I haven't been for Spoffles the previous year. I think might well have done. We had to get a revenge on those ugly Australians, didn't we? At least Mother lived long enough to see us do it. Ah, 
What an amazing woman she was, George. Bessie takes after, you know. Same striking good looks, the same energy. The same enthusiasm for the game, it seems. Ah. Fortunately, I don't have to coach her as I do the boys. Bessie, I can... I can just love for herself. Should be going. Yes, the cobbler should stick to his last if he's any good at it. <laughs> to sit up all night at a dying woman's bedside and know you can do nothing. What use am I there? She died. I could tell the child was still born before I delivered her. I thought the mother might pull through. <laughs> <laughs> well, at least it can be said I saved the father. Shall we go? Uh, Willie. It's not just to play the game your country needs you. Now the Conservatives are back in office and I've been given a post in the government, well, there's, there's even talk I might one day make a suitable Governor-General somewhere. I think you would too, my word. Well, whatever happens, I'll never again be available to Captain England at cricket. So I mean to persuade them at the MCC that the only man for that job now is you. Captain England? They're taking the time to get around to that. Harris could be made a Governor General soon, he says. Oh, get on with buckling those pads, will he? The crowd are getting restless out there. So he's going to use his influence with the MCC. He shouldn't need influence to get you the job. It's a great honor, Ted. Now, can you see my cap anywhere? Well, only that silly little yellow thing of yours. You're not wearing that today. It's my MCC cap, murder I shall. You're playing for Gloucestershire today, not England. I always play for England, even when I turn up for Gloucestershire. Oh, Willie. We have our own ground instead of borrowing one from a public school. You could at least engage some good club cricketers instead of always picking from the public schools. Get on with it, doctors! That doesn't sound like gentry to me. Yes, yeah, probably somebody would rather see painter here than you. What? A Gloucestershire man, as you were once. Not a not a renegade who likes to lead his side in the colours of another club. I'm proud of my England colours, Dad. Like it or not, England would always come first with me. Bolt him hurt. We wouldn't have come almost bottom of the county championship last year if you hadn't deserted us so often for your aristocratic friends of the MCC. What are you waiting for, Hearn? <coughs> oh, confound you, man. Sorry, sir. Oh. Didn't think it had lift like that. It just slipped. Serve you right for not concentrating on the ball. Oh, must have broken at least three fingers. Let's have a look at that. What are you doing, Coroner? Hold it in, quest on it! Who was that? Who was that? I'll have no one from the crowd barrack me. Who's that? What are you after? He's going after him with his bat. <laughs> I forgive him everything. Oh, where would cricket be without the graces? I ought never to have gone. What's that tour done for me, Mr. Shaw? Oh, you took a fair lot of wickets, lad. Keep sending them down like that. Might be years of employment for you yet. Till a month scrap heap like most old pros. Greatest bowler of your time you were, Mr Shaw. Don't I'll end up at your age managing tours to Australia for the likes of Lord Sheffield. Come and have a drink. <laughs> Jim Babcock's a landlord here. Jim made enough from the game to set himself up with a public ass. Well, you see, he was always civil to the gentry and uh, never got the big one out more than he could help. Uh, Why, if it ain't out sure. I thought you was out in Australia with the doctor. Just got back. Come up on the boat train to Waterloo this morning. This is Jack Briggs. I do. Briggs, eh? <laughs> you knocked a few Aussies down out there, from what I heard. Uh, Jim was with WG in Australia back in 73. Doubt it's changed much since. Working man's a lot better off over there than he is here, I can tell you that. Oh, well. Aside from that, uh, it's a right little England down under these days. They like to the copies and everything. Oh, I bet the old man had to go to me over that, eh? He made more enemies than Ron's. Good for him. We lost a series. And Lord Sheffield lost £2,000. The lads end up with barely enough in their pockets to get them home, while Willie gets 3000 for his services. Expenses, too, for himself and his missus. And a locum paid to run his practice in Bristol. It's my reckoning as manager that one-fifth of the whole cost of the tour was spent on the doctor. And you like the fella? <laughs> well, you can't help liking the old fox. At the time was, I couldn't stand him. Proper young master he thought himself to be. Oh, but Willie and I have long since made up our differences. Hmm. Since you come up in the world yourself? That's right, laddie. Manager now, aren't I? Give him a pint of ale, Jim. Anyway, like him or not, 
He's England, he is. He's what? Go over there to the Oval June and test much, Sonny, and what do you see? On one side the pavilion, the gentry, the smart carriages, on the other the public. And out there in the middle, <laughs> a lad like you from the cotton mills, maybe, bowling to the Honourable A.J. Littleton at the stumps. The son, young Lord Harris, or rather to the ships, and a baker's son like me beside him. And directing operations, <laughs> the big fella. The bearded wonder himself. Just a flipping country doctor who comes from neither side. Uniting us all against the Aussies or anyone else who dares to tack us on. Jim's right. He's England. The only England you and I will ever know at any rate. Smithers! Where the devil are you? In the cabbage patch, sir. Them slugs is back again. Go, oh, never mind the slugs. They think as I've only one thumb to pick them off the leaves with, they can take advantage. <laughs> But they don't know me. I want these bottles of champagne down the well. We've had a telegram from Gilbert. It's coming home today. Well, I thought you said as how you were playing for his university next week. <laughs> so he's after some last minute coaching from his father, I expect. <laughs> Papa, Papa. We had junior sports practice today, and I almost won the 220 yards. Almost? If it weren't for Jones and Hamilton and Cooper, I would have done. When's the great day? I'll run beside you so I will. Fathers can't run. Beside you, I said. Pace it to victory. Won't be the first time I've covered the sports track at Clifton College. I won the visitor's race there when I wasn't much older than you. Willie, there's been a letter from Edgar. He's coming home on leave. Will he be in his uniform? Now, don't interrupt, Charlie. Arrives on Saturday. Does Bessie know? Where's Bessie? On the pitch with the Gloucestershire players. Now, run along. Bessie! Edgar's coming home! If you were here by Wednesday, you could see his brother make his debut against the MCC. And here's the young champion himself! Bertie! Hmm. Why, we only got your telegram two hours ago. I sent it on my way to the station. Champagne's down the well. He hasn't made that sentry yet, Willie. Soon will, though. 84 in the freshman's match. Do you know, Bertie, the MCC had the brass face to expect me to play for them on Wednesday against my old son. <gasps> what the devil? All right, do the cucumber frame it out. Oh, I do think. Now look you here, Painter. I don't mind the players using the pitch for getting in some practice, but this is my garden, not the county ground. It wasn't Painter who hit it, Papa. It was me. But he bowled me such a dreadful ball that I just had to give it what he deserved. Ha 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 ha! That'll teach you, Painter. Bessie plays at Clifton High School. For girls. Oh, my Bertie, how lovely. Bessie. <laughs> I'm having a day off school next week to come and watch you. Uh, Papa's even ordered a frock coat for the occasion. <laughs> Can you imagine? Papa in a frock coat. <laughs> I'm afraid he won't be needing it. Won't be what? That's what I've come here to tell you, Papa. I've not been selected. Can't have it. Shan't have it. Won't have it. Smithers! Go into the house. I want to use a telegram. Not even you can tell the captain of cricket at Cambridge University whom to choose, Papa. That telegram, not that dunderhead. It's the MCC. We'll accept captaincy against Cambridge Wednesday. Conditional selecting team. Not play you. You'll play against them. You'll open the bat with me for the MCC. Dear God, please let Bertie make runs today. Please. Now restrict yourself, Bessie. He looks so unhappy going out there with Papa. He's probably just a bit nervous, that's all. Nervous? He's petrified. Oh, I do believe Papa's going to make him take first ball. No reason why you shouldn't, Gilbert. Show these lads what you're made of. Protecting the middle of leg stump, Papa. You have it, sir? What's your name, Bowler? Uh, Barrow, sir. Oh, I know your father. Fine batsman. Dreadful fielder. Come to think of it, it was the worst I ever did see. Well done. Let's see you turn your arm over that. Steady, birdie. The gold ain't to send these lot leather hunting. Ah, uh, it's a splendid ground, Fenners, don't you think, Burrow? Oh, look at those ducks flying there across the sun. I'd rather keep my eyes for the wicket, sir. If he'd only have more confidence in himself. He probably would have if he didn't have his father at the other end. What's that? Out. It was a no ball. The ball was good, sir. Oh. Well, 
no. Well, I suppose there's one consolation. There'll be no holding your father now. Cambridge, fashion for 139, and it's the same story here. Two, please. Another duck from the boy, and what do we get from the old man? 196 not out. <laughs> he should have the lad play with him more often. Oh, you got my ticket. I owe you. You can buy the beer. Right, you're on. What's happening now? He has to see batting again. He must have skittled Cambridge out quick then. And by the look of that scoreboard, the lad's not doing badly this time. On 47. Oh, that looked close. It was probably plum, but it takes a bold umpire to stand up with the doctor at Lords. Willie regards Lords as his private territory. It was a good pitch to bat on first. If he hadn't won the toss. Oh, he probably thinks that too. He has God at his side as well as the umpires. I remember a match when he called woman as they spun the coin. When it came down tails with the figure of Britannia on it, he decided to bat. It was only as they went back to the pavilion the other skipper realised if it had come down heads, it would have shown the Queen. <laughs> good stroke. Hey, that's the boys, 50. Well done, well done Bertie, well done. Now for the century. Ever since the lad was born, he's been waiting for the day when he'd play with him at Lord's. He doesn't want him to see much of the bowling, though, does he? Have you noticed? There's no run there. You see, he wants to face himself. He'll be run out. Miss. I know, Oh, They're running the second. Where's the ball gone, Jim? Here, they take the third. Come on, come on, Bertie, run up. But where's the ball? Run! Dr. Grace, I, I don't know how many you intend to run, but may we have our ball back, please? It's somewhere on your person. <laughs> it's in my shirt. It missed the wicket when he threw it and bounced up into my shirt. Take it out, Burroughs. What I couldn't get away. I'm going to be giving up a hand in the ball. That's five runs for Gilbert. No, sir. Very well, then, but at least the first two will stand. Oh, it may not be quick enough, but don't the crowd love it? Always entertain the spectators, he says. It's one of his maxims. Oh. <laughs> at Lord's and you make 56? Oh, I wish I'd had the chance to. You'd probably have made a century, Bessie. Papa! Come on! You missed the train! It won't go without him, however long he stands on a platform with anyone who wants to shake his hand. He's coming now. I'll be in the corridor. Why? I just want to be on my own. Oh, nearly missed the... There you are, Bertie. Join the scenery. Now, look you here. I want you available for the MCC in every fixture to the end of the season. Build on that splendid knock this morning, you're bound to get your blue next summer. By the time you I come, I do don't... have my studies to pursue as well. Oh, Cambridge is not just for bookworms, Bertie. Well, there have been talk of me going there. Yeah, there was. Huh? I was off at a place. I could have been up there with Lord Harris. But my father wouldn't hear of it, so I had to go to medical school. That didn't happen to you. We're a deal better off than my father ever was. Oh, the gentleman cricketable. We'll need to find some suitable profession for you later, but there's time enough for that. Do well in the next two seasons, and with your background, Clifton College and Cambridge, they won't dilly dally before asking you to captain England. I don't want to captain England. I don't even like playing cricket much. Not your kind. I enjoy it as a game when no one cares a fig how well you do, but I certainly don't want it to get in the way of my degree. Degree? What's a degree you ever done for a man? I'm proud to be the first grace ever to go to university, Father. I'm grateful to you for getting me there, but a good degree will mean I can become a schoolmaster. Oh, what? I'm quite sure I have a vocation for teaching, so uh, if I work hard... Schoolmaster? Edgar goes off to join the Navy for some reason I've never fathomed the note. You Sons don't always have to follow in their father's footsteps, surely. I did. Lord Harris, welcome back, my lord. The club doesn't seem to have changed much in five years away, Pinkerton. Changed, sir? The captain. I'm told Lord Sheffield's in the club. In the billiard room, sir. Aha. Uh -huh. 
Oh, yeah, you haven't heard the latest from Bristol, have you? It was 53 not out in the paper. You tell me, too. There'll be another edition on the street any minute, sir. I'll keep you informed. I'll give you a word. Ah, hello, Harris. I was in there. Hot. I believe I have cause to congratulate you. President of the MCC this year? Yes. Can't think why after five years away from the game. Oh, talking of which, I suppose you don't happen to know. No, I was going to ask you. The club port has got nothing beyond 53 not out. Either he's back in the pavilion by now, or he's done it. A hundred centuries. Incredible. Well, that's not incredible. The incredible thing is I doubt if there's a man in the country at this moment not awaiting the news just as eagerly as we are. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I truly really believe it's W.G. who holds the empire together. Yes. Among the troops in India, whatever the social difference between the officers and the men, they have a common bond in the doings of the champion. Yes. I heard a subaltern addressing his platoon on the way to deal with those devils on the northwest frontier. Now, do you know the score, he said? Let's go out there and hit them for six. <laughs> And they all cheered. Yeah, a pity the Queen isn't a little more interested in the game. Yeah, well, that's just why I've come to see you, Sheffield. As this year's president of the MCC, I want to see to it that his services to his country are recognised. Great service! Hundred, hundred, three dollar about it! Great you hear that? I oh. do believe that... He's oh. my lord. One hundred and two not out. Oh. Here in the star. Uh, that was at lunchtime. So he's probably on the way to making it a double by now. One hundred and eighty-eight, Mama. Oh, I wish I could be batting there with him. I'd give quite a lot to be out there myself, Bessie. As it is, he's got young Townsend. Where did you find that boy, Cliff? Oh, he's one of Willie's young protégés. He was at Clifton with Bertie, Mama. Much younger, of course. Oh, I don't need Bertie to play like that. I'm sure he can, really. I suppose if he could, my dear, he'd be out there batting now. And wouldn't Papa have loved that? <laughs> oh. Your father was a pretty good player, too, young fella. Is he watching you today? Yes, sir. He must be the proudest man on earth. I know I would be. If Gilbert had half the talent that boy's got, I do believe your father would have been willing at last to hang up his back. Papa will never do that. He's 47 years old, Bessie. Now go and look for Charlie. He promised he'd be here this afternoon. Only if he could get off school. And I'm not sure he wanted to today. Hmm, handsome woman she's grown into, hasn't she? <laughs> she's your niece. Hmm, two marriages and nine children between them don't mean I can't still appreciate a pretty girl. It's so ironical, isn't it? That out of the four of them, it should be Bessie who has the most talent and love for the game. Well, nothing was expected of her, was it? So she sets out to emulate her brothers just to make sure she's noticed. As her father did himself as a child. You can scarcely imagine how jealous I was when Willie overtook me so swiftly. I've never heard you admit that before. Never have before. But at 22, I was the most famous young cricketer in the world. Out in Australia with Pars 11, the only gentleman in the side. And got back too late for a couple of matches at home in which Willie played for you instead. Your but, mother told me. But if my boat had docked just two days earlier, Agnes, I'd have got to hope in time for the second one, where Willie made 170 not out. At 15! Lily White's cricketing companion referred to him then as the young brother of the celebrated cricketer. I never knew it rankled. So, I got down to my studies, qualified as soon as I could, took a wife and a practice, and settled for being secretary, not captain. Well, this time I laid the ghost of all that, if you ask me. It's long overdue. What do you mean, what is? A public act of homage to the master. Oh, Chid, where are you going? I can't find Charlie anywhere, Mama. Do you really want Papa to give up cricket? Not give it up, just stop playing it so much. Well, this talk of something in London, which if it comes off, would be just the thing. I can't imagine living in London. <laughs> when I was your age, I couldn't imagine living anywhere else. the right temperature, sir. Sir! Uh, you're a clown. Uh, it's been down the well long enough after all. <laughs> Alfred! 
What's all this about? Test match tomorrow and fight players on strike? Who are they? Well, Jack Briggs is the main one. And when Gunn agreed to walk out too... Lord Chiffle says isn't you here to talk to them? Well, it's not to do with him, of course. But as we happened to be in London when we heard the news... He thought as an old pro yourself, you might drum some sense into him. Have you? Well, I left him to think it over. Said I'd be out here on the pitch. In their dressing room, are they? Will he? you do best to keep out of it. How dare they put personal gain before playing for their country? Oh, that's right, Royal, coming from you, Willie. It's partly on account of what you're being paid that Briggs has let him out. I only get my expenses. And the lads just get a fee. A tenner for the match and now for how they get to it. What do you get? Cover for three days in London and whatever you charge for another doctor to look after your practice. As an amateur, you've made more out of the game in the 30 years you've been at it than all the professionals put together, Willie. Oh, not that you don't deserve it, mind. But have you heard they're going to build a new pavilion, are there? A great palace for the members. There's to be a new dressing room for the players, too? Comparatively, it'll still be no more than the shack they've got now. The working cricketer is no better off today than he was when I turned down your offer for touring Australia back in 73. He's better off than any other working man, I'd say. Well, that's something cricket should be proud of. In 81, I took the Nottingshire players out on strike. <laughs> and lost the county championship in consequence. You mean the club did, rather than pay their professionals a fair wage. So little got it, did you? And with the same end to it here at the Oval. Their nibs would rather lose to Australia than give in. Once it come to me, the masters always win. I thought to become one myself. Run tours of me own, as I did with Lillywhite. End up training young cricketers to play for Sussex. God help me. And be right-hand man to Lord Sheffield, his major domo, his constant companion. A comfortable job for so long as I want it. You see, I didn't have the power as you have, Willie. <laughs> power? Me? Oh, you could soon get Briggs and the lads what they want if you said you'd not play otherwise. But you didn't send your son to Clifton College and Varsity to have the gentry think you were on the side of the working man, did you? I'm on no one's side. Which is just why you make such a right fine champion for them. Men die for you, Willie. What the devil do you mean? I've heard said. Africa, India, wherever the British are hitting the natives to the boundary ropes, Lord Harris's England should be right grateful to you. You've done wonders for cricket, Willie. But there's a sight more you could have done for your country if you hadn't let yourself be used. London has two grounds already. One for Surrey and the other for Middlesex. <clears throat> it deserves its own tag. In Crystal Palace, we have just a place for it. There. I've snooped you neatly. Uh, Londoners have no sense of county. They've no sense at all. They wouldn't be there. When do you take up the job? In the spread. Agnes and Bessie are up there already in a furnished house I found for them at Sydenham. Once I've disposed of the practice here, I'll join them. Go, Stroke. Oh, you're, you're putting me quite off my game. Agnes has long had a yearning for the metropolis, Tad. With Gilbert away teaching and Edgar in the Navy, there's only Bess and Charlie still at home. <sighs> and I'll pull off something pretty good for Charlie. The club had a bait for his tuition to London Engineering School. Uh, what else have you done them for? On top of my salary, a shilling and a guinea for membership fees and 5% of all the gate money. You should have been a businessman, not a cricketer. Fortunately... I've successfully been both. Last, I was going to set you up on the pink. London's the harder game, Ted. But at my age, that's where I can best make my contribution. It's where you've always made it. No. It was only Mother who ever brought you back to where your roots are. I'm still Captain Gloucestershire for you. <laughs> you missed. After that remark, I'm not surprised. Captain, two clubs at once. Thanks for the railways, it's perfectly possible. I doubt if the committee will agree to a visiting captain. The committee will do as I tell them. They always do. Gloucestershire deserves better than this from you, Willie. I say, to see that pot of mine? Wasn't that splendid? I'll tell you where the heart of the game is, Willie. It's on the village green at Thornbury, where I swing the bat and lumber up to bowl every Saturday with the rest of them. It's in the counties up north, where you and I took the game in the days of your United England eleven. Counties that don't even get to see the first-class game anymore. Thanks to the way your precious friends at the 
MCC have fixed the rules for the county championship. So football is now the people's game because cricket you've delivered totally into the hands of the public schools. I've delivered it to no one. It's your turn. So that the likes of Lord Harris can use it to demonstrate to the lower orders and the ignorant native overseas the so-called manly virtues their cold bath curriculum has taught them to believe are so important. But they are important. So very virtues, team spirit, commitment, unselfishness, playing the game that made this country and the empire what it is. Whatever Alf Shaw may say, I see nothing wrong with Lord Harris's England as he calls it. We set an example of the rest of the world. Well, I have a feeling in my bones that one of these days Britannia's going to find she can't defend her wicket any longer with that silly little trident she uses for a bat. Someone's going to bowl her a shooter. Oh, who? Who could? Yes, girl, what is it? Mrs. Smithers is here, sir. He's brought the telegram. Smithers? You was out, sir, so I took the liberty of opening it in case it were important. The devil you did. So I come right along, sir, quick as I could. Bessie, desperately ill. Come at once, Agnes. Bessie. We thought it was just a fever at first, so I didn't tell your father. It would only have worried him. When did Papa get here? He didn't even get my telegram till late at night. He was playing billiards with your Uncle Edward. So by the time he arrived next day... Surely when you knew it was typhoid, Mother, you I could... didn't know, Edgar. These doctors, they don't tell you anything. I don't suppose they knew themselves. Where's Papa now? Over at the Crystal Palace ground. Playing cricket? Of course not, Edgar. But you know your father. He always has to be doing something, especially at a time like this. Edward's with him. Tell you this, Tad. Never again will I ever spend a single night away from home. There was nothing you could have done. <laughs> and we're supposed to be doctored? She was 20. That's the age when a woman's at her peak. In the bloom of youth and vigor. No, she made 63 for the ladies of Clifton, and I wasn't even there to watch. Well, <laughs> cricket's no game for a woman. Tennis, if you like. That's a woman's game, and no mistake, but... Uh, but I loved her more than any of them. Oh, I had hopes for the boys, though. None of them fulfilled them, though. But Bessie. With Bessie, I could just be a, be a father. Typhoid. What's the cause of typhoid? I'll tell you another thing, Tad. Never again will I presume to practice medicine, either. Uh, very well, gentlemen. If there's no other business, that concludes the meeting of the committee. I shall write to my brother as you request. Want to know, in view of your commitment to the London County Club... Just how many matches you intend to play in for Gloucestershire during the forthcoming season? I've intended to play in nearly all our matches, but in view of the attitude adopted by the committee, I hereby tender my resignation. I have the greatest affection for the county of my birth, but for the committee, the greatest contempt. Oh, Willie, you need not use language like that to them. I told Edward after Bessie's death that never again would I spend a night away from home. So why not just say that to them kindly? Ah, we wouldn't pull the wool over Ted's eyes. He'd know there was more to it than that. He called me a renegade once. For putting the country before Gloucestershire. Well, I'm not ashamed of that. That's why I've decided to accept the invitation from the MCC to Captain England against Australia next week. Oh, Willie, you're 51 years old, out of condition and vastly overweight. They only want you for your name. My name? You rally the country, and with the war blowing up in South Africa and all this unrest at home with the radicals and the socialists... What on earth has all that got to do with me? Everything, Willie. To see W.G. Grace lead the country against Australia again. How often, when you played for England in the past, has someone not compared your innings with some great achievement by General Gordon or Cecil Rhodes or Sir Herbert Kitchener. You're just being used. Oh, used? Oh, first Shaw, then Ted, and now you. I'm, I'm just a cricketer, Agnes. 
Never at any time have you been just that. I shall accept the honour they have done me and play at Trent Bridge. Uh, splendid to see the champion at the helm again, isn't it? Just the Philip the country needs. Oh, dear. What? Well, you can't expect him to be as nimble a fielder as he was in his prime, can you? <laughs> well, I'm dashed. I never thought I'd live to see the day when W.G. Grace was booed. Say again, that's what he said to Jackson after the test that year, and he meant it. We've played for lots of clubs since 1899. Not too seriously, as it would have to be if he turned out for Gloucestershire again. Oh, dash it. Played seriously enough against us in that match with London County the year before last. Isn't it true that ill-starred enterprise at Crystal Palace is coming to an end, as I always guessed it would? It was only when Willie played that the public seemed to turn up to watch, as, as if he was some performing bear. But you know your brother, ever resilient. <laughs> He's taking up a new game now. What? Bowls. Bowls? Mm -hmm. That's an old man's game. So Willie has decided to master it. At 56, he may be getting past it as a cricketer. But for bowls, he has it all before him. Hello, sir. What's this about you taking up bowls? Well, I've been working at it for three years now. Oh, it's a fascinating game. In fact, though in London we only have a cellar, not a well... I think we can call this a special occasion. Celebrating what, dear? A reconciliation with Gloucestershire. <laughs> England's to play Scotland in Edinburgh next month. At cricket? Against Scotsmen? <laughs> At Bowles Ted. And a singular honour has been done me. I have been invited to captain the English team. <laughs> who, who can that be? I've been working on me golf pretty hard, too. Played 45 holes the other day with Jessup's so I did. Why, it's Edgar out there. Edgar. Oh, what a lovely surprise for us. Oh, on leave. I never did understand what he thought so exciting about the Navy. Whenever I was at sea, I was generally ill. Now Gilbert's as good as joined the service, too. But he's a schoolmaster. Ah, teaching at the Royal Naval College at Osborne now. Edgar sees quite a lot of him. They even play cricket together. Not the Navy can feel much of a team, eh? Hit a ball out of the ground on board ship and you never see it again. <laughs> Fabulous. What's the matter with you, woman? Edgar, what, what's happened? It's Bertie. He was taken ill with appendicitis that they had to operate. Of course they did, man. What else? I don't know whether it was left too late or... or whether something went wrong on the operating table, but... Gilbert. The fighting on the continent is very severe, and likely to be prolonged. The time has arrived when the county cricket season should be closed. For it is not fitting that able-bodied men should still be playing cricket. I should like to see all of suitable age set a good example and come to the help of their country in its hour of need. He was gardening. Cutting off dead heads on the border there. Why it should bring on a stroke, I don't know. Any more than I know why Bessie or Gilbert or indeed Fred should have died. At least Willie hasn't died, Agnes. How is he? Oh, cheerful enough, I suppose, for a man in his condition. But he's had to live through a whole summer without cricket. If only he hadn't written that letter to the sportsman about closing down the season. Oh, they'd have closed it anyway, Agnes. He's never known a year without county cricket since he first learnt the game in the family orchard. It's left him with a vacuum he can't even imagine how to fit. Not even with golf or bowls or curling at the Queen's Club ice rink, which I understand is his evening recreation. I'm told he was even playing cricket just a month before the war broke out. For our local side, Eltham, he made 69 not out, three more than his age. And still not out, Agnes. May I see him? Of course. Come into the house. Willie? Mm, don't wake him. I can talk to him later. It's almost dark. Will you stay the night? Well, if I may. Of course. Uh, play up, play up. 
Play the game, play the game. Willie, George is here. George. 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 Oh, the damn it, Agnes. Why didn't you warn me, finding me here on my back? Stay where you are, man. Uh, even you are entitled to put your feet up sometimes when you've notched up 67. Did we really let them think that war was just a game of cricket, George? That's an absurd idea. <laughs> sure thought we did. Men die for me, said. What nonsense. Edward said we'd get a shooter one day. What went wrong with your England, George? My England? I believed in it. Meeting adversity with a straight bat and always, always for the batsman, just as one against eleven. Courage, determination, patience. What's wrong with all that? I'd like to know. Nothing's wrong. The match isn't over yet. The lads are out there now, hitting the hun for six. Play up. Play up and play the game. Comes from a poem that Edgar read me once. Oh, can you find it, Agnes? It's stars of the cricket match on Clifton College clubs. Ten to make and the match to win, an hour to play and the last man in. <laughs> That's the one. The captain's hand on his shoulder smote. Play up, play up and play the game. Mm. Never been much of a reader myself. Only a book I ever read for pleasure was one that told me how to win at West. <laughs> that never did me much good, I can tell you. So much reading is bad for the eyesight. That's what Gilbert's trouble was. Always had his head in box. So he had to wear glasses and could never see the ball too clearly. <laughs> <laughs> well, it never caught me that way. It's not what a man knows. It's what he does that matters. Character. Action. That's what they taught you at your school, didn't they, George? Cold bath curriculum. Not that I'm much of a believer in bathing myself. The graces aren't a family of war, a spaniel. <laughs> well, what you were taught at Eton, George, I learned at my mother's knee. I'm not ashamed of how much money I made to get on in the world, leave something behind you. What's wrong with that, for heaven's sake? Can you find the poem, Magnus? It's the next bit that bothers me. There's a war, a battle. There. The Gatling's jammed and the Colonel's dead. Oh, that's all I can remember. The Gatling's jammed and the Colonel's dead. England's far and honour a name. But the voice of a schoolboy rallies the ranks. Play up, play up and play the game. It was not a game, George. No, of course not. But if men go out and fight with the same spirit of determination you showed at the wicket. As if all they've got to do is hit the hun for six. No wonder they went into bat so merrily. Over by Christmas, they said. Oh, the young cricketer. Was it our fault, George? Was it? Ted would have had something to say to me if he'd left the season. You know... In his last match, when he put himself on the boat, he had someone stand beside him, helping to turn his arm over. <laughs> <laughs> well, he was nigh on seventy. What was that? Nothing, dear. I think just... It sounds like an air raid. Oh, I'm not sure, George. They don't come over so early. Yes. Yes, they do. Once it's dark. No, we, we, we must go downstairs. No, Willie, Willie, there's nothing to be afraid of. I should think not. It's only those Zeppelins. They worry him so much, I don't know why. I don't know why. Those bombs can kill us. They can kill us all. Oh, think what it must be like at the front where they're being mowed down. Willie, the chances of a bomb hitting How his How can you be so afraid of Zeppelins anyway, Willie? You, who stood up on the fiercest of pitches to balls coming at you through your beard. And didn't even flinch. Oh, however fast they bolted me, George. When I was in form, it came under the bat the size of a football. I could always see it. Well, those buggers floating up there in the dark, no one can see those.
In The Champion by Martin Worth, the part of W.G. Grace was played by Timothy Spall, Agnes Zela Clark, Martha Diana Olson, Fanny Julie Berry, Edward Richard Durden, Fred Trevor Nichols, Lord Harris Paul Chapman, Lucy Sue Broomfield, Babcock Alan Thompson, Alfred Shaw Struan Roger, Gilbert Jonathan Cullen, Bessie Jill Lidstone, Edgar Andrew Branch, with Alan Dudley, David Goodland, Paul Gregory, Stephen Harold, Brian Hewlett, Tim Reynolds, Paul Russell, Stephen Thorne, and Ian Thompson. The play was directed by Jane Morgan. The amazing test match crime by Adrian Allington. Clearly a good result for England and a less good one for Australia. What a marvellous summary that is. England have won the fifth and final test match and the series by one run and a donkey drop. And now, as the crowds gather around the pavilion... That evening, a crowd gathered outside our house in Flood Street. There we are, my heroic son. A bandage for your poor head. But, Monica... Lie still, my wounded warrior. But... Would my I... mangled martyr like a glass of water or a change of pillow? Monica... Yes? You know, don't you, that I had to do what I did. I couldn't have left the skipper in the hands of those villains. You could have, but you didn't. Because you're a loyal and long-suffering serf, aren't you? Yes. Does that hurt? No. But because of it, you see, I... I never played for England. No, I know you didn't. I still, while I apply balm to your bruised body. But... I see, did, though. You? I took your place, Joe. It was I who went on the field as twelfth man. And I who advised truth to bowl that donkey drop. Oh, Monica. And so you see... One of us has played for England. I'm sure Father wouldn't mind which it was. Monica, you're... you're wonderful. I think I am, rather. Lie still, dear Joe, while I take your temperature and then I will put your arm in a sling. But... but Monica, dear, there's nothing wrong with it. As far as I'm concerned, we won the game and the series fair and square. The powers that be, however, were of a different mind. Yes? Controversy dogged this game almost as soon as the last ball had been bowled. The press had a field day. What were the police doing to capture the bad men of his arse? And who was the mysterious twelfth man if Prestwick had at the time been bound and gagged somewhere in the heart of Lomshire? But soon these questions were overshadowed by a controversy that threatened to bring the playing of international cricket to an untimely end. It has gone down in history as the great donkey drop controversy. Yes, well, it started when his cricket board sent a letter to Lord saying that the donkey drop was not a legitimate ball to bowl and therefore the match should be played again. Stuff and nonsense. Oh, well, Norm, you've got to remember the body line series. Let me ask you, Leth, were you physically threatened by that ball? No. Was it bowled or chucked? It was bowled. Did you protest at the time? No, 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 but... you didn't. In fact, you were most sporting about the whole thing. If I remember correctly, your comment at the time was, everyone is very fit. Hardly the statement of a man deeply aggrieved. Now, I'm afraid the truth is, Lethbridge, that your board were miffed, that's all. Plain miffed. They were miffed, that's all. It was just common or garden sour grapes. And the result was that, not wishing to unduly upset one of the colonies, the Houses of Parliament debated a bill declaring the game a draw. Which, of course, is an impossibility in an endless test. Oh, it was a shameful day for England. Give these people an inch and they'll take a mile. The debate makes fascinating reading. It can be found in Hansard, but it seems in hindsight inevitable that the bill would be passed, the match declared a draw, and Lethbridge's final score adjusted to read 65 not out. It still makes my blood boil. It would not be going too far to say that that wretched Craven bill marked the beginning of the end of empire. Give them an inch and they'll take a mile. Nothing personal, you understand, Leth? We all thought we'd failed miserably. I remember sitting in that cafe with... Carlo and... And me. Uh, yeah, but we were sitting at another table. But I was there. Yes, of course we were there. But you weren't at our table. You weren't at our table when the professor arrived. I heard everything he said, oh, I'm sure you did. Well, it came as quite a surprise, Mr. Johnston. There we were, sitting, when along came the professor, disguised as a yachtsman. As he passed me, he furtively handed me a bulky package. And then he came and sat at our table. 
The proceeds, my friends, of our recent trip to England. Gee, boss, say, do these international punks out of the door okay and hunky-dory? As you see, Carlos. Ain't they swell? But do they realize it? We were defeated. We failed. It seems that I underrated both the madness of the English and the insane complications of this game of crickets. It appears that after our somewhat hurried departure from the Oval, an English sportsman by the name of Truth outwitted the principal native Lethbridge by bowling in an illegitimate manner. Oh. There is a kind of a ball known as a donkey drum, donkey drum, of which I must confess I had not previously heard, since it is not mentioned by Mr. L.E.G. Glance in his monumental work. The delivery of this ball has plunged the British Empire into the utmost confusion. Only urgent action by the English government, who have declared the match to be a draw, has prevented disaster. My employers, who, as I told you, represent important international interests, are greatly delighted at the turn of events and have congratulated me most warmly. The affair may therefore, despite certain hitches in our arrangements, be said to have concluded in a blaze of success. I always knew them guys was phony, but this sure beats everything. And now, my friends, as to our future operations, I have devised a novel and interesting scheme which I think will prove to be tolerably lucrative. I propose, in short, that we should kidnap the infant daughter of Socrates F. Grimwell, the well-known millionaire who is at present upon a visit to Europe from the United States. I, I can't tell you how relieved I was at the time. At last, a crime where I wouldn't feel such a wretched outcast, so utterly filthy. Carlo, he wasn't so keen. I guess this crime is not so good, since it is well known to one and all that us killers get very sentimental about little dolls, especially when these curly-headed dolls say, Tell me a fairy story, Mr. Stranger, because we get to thinking about our innocent childish days and our dear old mamas and Christmas, and then we get very sentimental indeed. So I think, Mama, maybe I'll give the boss the deadpan and give up crime. Yes, yes, extraordinary. Next day he was gone. Haven't heard from him since. Of course we both know, don't we, who he turned into? Yes, yes, yes of course we do. Who would have thought it? Two days later the professor disappeared as well. The bad men were no more. Curious, it was almost as if the professor needed Carlo, and without him we were mere shadows. <laughs> well, Alice and I decided to go traveling. We liked it here, decided to stay for a while, never left. It wasn't long before I got a nice little...